as we're slowly revealed. <laughs> <laughs> Who will it be this week? Yeah, by the time the end of the show, I will have, you know, it will take me so long to unclick and reveal every person on the team that the show will be over. Yes. Only by the in the last few minutes will you see everyone is there. Well, hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. Focus, Fraser, focus. This wow. is your weekly space hangout for Friday, February 7th, 2014. A week before Valentine's Day. Aww. Oh, I'm um, feeling the love. Yeah, next, and next week will be the actual Valentine's Day episode. Um, okay, so we okay. are going to be talking about uh, a new crater on Mars. Uh, asteroid Echo... Tokawa. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> did, I, did I mess that up? <laughs> Use your fun. words. Uh, uh, Tokawa. <laughs> um, uh, what he said. Cool uh, images of M82. Um, Venus. Progress launches. Um, oh, and we'll try to get that photo of the uh, Ariane 5 launch that was seen from space, which was awesome. Uh, more space history. Uh, Astronomy 365, we'll talk about that. Uh, super Earth being super habitable, which is pretty cool. A wobbly alien planet when galaxies collide and, and whatever Scott wants to talk about. So, <laughs> Ponies! Ponies, that's right. Because I don't see your information in the spreadsheet here, My Scott. stuff is in the spreadsheet. It's been in there. Nope, it was about nope. wobbly planets. Nope, it's, it's not in the spreadsheet. It's, it's not I spread. don't know what spreadsheet you're on, but it's not in <laughs> the spreadsheet. So Scott is going to be talking about his favorite My Little Pony, which is our <laughs> here on uh, the Weekly Space Hangout. I'm up to Google that now. <laughs> you have to um, Google your favorite My Little Pony? Yeah, yeah, you're on the wrong tab, Scott. Oh, well. <laughs> Um, the best. Hello. You know what's amazing about this show is just how professional and focused we are on delivering yes. a high quality <laughs> entertainment product. So, so for those of you that don't know, we write and talk about science and astronomy all the time, and apparently My Little Ponies. On yeah. So let me interview the people. Let me introduce the people who are here joining us today. We've got Amy Shore Title. Hey, Amy. Hello. I, word on the street is that you're writing and you barely come up for air anymore. I confirm or deny. Been on I haven't been on Facebook or Twitter except to post a picture of my cat in a week. So yeah, I've been I've been lost in a world. So it's good. I'm sorry if I seem really socially inept, guys. But <laughs> we look forward to your to writing, your publications. All the yeah. writing. <laughs> got Brian Coberline. Hey, Brian. Hi. You, on the other hand, have been incredibly prolific on all the things. So. I'm always incredibly prolific on all the And things. also, very dapper today. Very really dapper. Bringing up the, uh, the quality of the show. Setting a new bar. Yeah. Nobody will let this go, apparently. No. You guys we won't. See will it. not. It's our, it's our way to bring it's you... It's lovely. ...drag you back down to our level. That's right. This is what I teach him, so... <laughs> David so, And, he, and we, he <laughs> intends to school us in all things science. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to... P buckle up, people. This is going to be a weird one. <laughs> Dave Dickinson. Your hey, how you doing? Stay and, warm. And you're a science writer. Yeah, I, I thought that would be the least ironic thing I could do is to not be pithy this week. So that would be the late the thing people would least expect. So, it, so I in really, a way, I, it is pithy. I didn't see it coming. You never saw it coming. No. <laughs> Elizabeth Howell. Hey, Elizabeth. You're muted. Hello, everybody. So I'm not right here. And one thing, just to let people know, is Elizabeth Howell is joining Universe Today for, like, has, a, like, a staff position or something. Yay! For hey, people? Yay. What? Yeah. So she's, like, working full-ish time for us now and, uh, and writing all the things, and it's awesome. So thanks, Thank Elizabeth. You. Thank you. I'm having such fun. Yeah. Um, we got Morgan Rinberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. You are so dependable. You've been here every week, week after week after week. I really appreciate it. It's fun. Keep coming yeah. back. Well, welcome to the team. Dr. Nicole, the noisy astronomer, Gallucci. I think you just skipped Scott. No, I haven't. He's I'm alphabetical. Oh, First, really? Yeah. Oh, a, I see why you're in control for that. I'm yeah. so confused. Oh you're, you see yourself over on the right-hand side of the hangout. But okay, that's that. new. It's not new. Ish. Should I just, okay, to what? Scott Lewis. Hi, everybody. I'm last, but not last. No, you're not last. And now, last but not least, we've got Nicole Galucci. <laughs> I'll get it together. I'm 
<laughs> All right, so this is an interactive experience. If you want to communicate and, uh, and hang out with us, you can. Uh, I've installed the Q&A app on this Hangout, so you should see that wherever you're watching this show on YouTube, on Universe Today, on Google+, embedded into any other websites where it is. So uh, go ahead and put a question there, and we'll sort of keep an eye on those and try and incorporate them. The other thing you can do is on Google+, there's the Weekly Space Hangout uh, page, the event. You can post any comments and questions there. I don't. Nicole, you're going to watch that. You usually watch that. I watch the event page and then the actual video event page, and that's pretty much it. I don't. Okay. YouTube doesn't update for me. Live, I'll check so. you. Yeah. Okay. I'll, you can do that. I'll be the. YouTube and then I guess today. Twitter, if someone yeah. wants to use the hashtag, what space hangout? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't put one, didn't put one up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hashtags, right. words, Twitter, and things. What is this Twitter yeah. thing? I don't know what this Twitter thing is. So, <laughs> All right, well, let's get rolling. So I want, hmm, what do I want to talk about first? Actually, you know what? I really want to talk about this new impact creator that's on Mars, and that's you, Morgan. Yeah, let me put up a picture to start this off. Um, this is really cool. All right, can you see that? No. No. Oh, oh, boy. All right. Well, let's try that again. Everybody. Like a hall of mirrors out there. One more time. <laughs> now we it's just double. now it's just space hangout all the way down. How about that? Needs. Nope. Now you just it's us. All over the place here. Why all don't right. you talk? There you go. There we go. All right. right. So oh, there it is. Okay. Here is a beautiful new impact crater on Mars, as seen by uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, late last year. Uh, what we're looking at here this is about 30 um, meters across. And, you know, that's not a real big crater, but we don't usually see them just, you know, right after they've hit, basically. And so this story kind of goes back three, three, three and a half years. Um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been orbiting Mars now for eight years, just constantly taking these really high-resolution pictures of Mars. And because it's been going for so long now, it's been taking multiple pictures of the same point, um, same places on the surface, over and over again. And sometimes it seems differences. And so, for example, this region, they took a picture of it back in 2010 and didn't see anything, just basically flat ground. Then they came back in 2012, took another picture, and they saw this kind of blurry feature that looked different. Uh, and they said, hmm, what's that? And so last year, back in November uh, of 2013, they basically zoomed in with this high-resolution camera and snapped this picture. Uh, and so what we see here is a crater at the middle, and then all this bluish material shooting out in all directions. That's what we call the ejecta. That's the material that was once in the crater that's now been thrown out. Now, look look along the edges. You can actually see what looks like, like cracking along the right-hand side of the image, and then sort of a little down below. It's a reverse for you. So imagine the left side of the image for you. Yeah. I mean, do you see that cracking there? Do you think that was caused by the impact? Absolutely. So when these things hit, they hit really fast and really hard. So impacts on the Earth, for example, can hit at 20 or 30 kilometers per second. Uh, that's, that's even for a really small object like this, that's a, a lot of kinetic energy, a lot of force hitting the surface. And so not only do you blast this material out of the center of the crater, but you send sort of a shock wave going out. And this shock wave can kind of ripple like an earthquake through the uh, the surface, and if it's if it's brittle, it'll cause these cracks, and you might be able to see concentric rings uh, around the crater, and that's uh, sort of the wave motion of the surface uh, responding to uh, responding to this impact. Wow. We got a comment from uh, Andrew Planet who says it looks like a sea urchin. <laughs> yeah. Sea yeah. urchin yeah. crater. The, the planetary imager in me wonders if anybody might have caught that while they were filming or imaging Mars. I mean, it gives quite a large span of time, and it would have to happen when Mars would turn forward for anybody to see it. If it happened when Mars was that area, that longitude was turned away, they wouldn't have caught it. But, you know, it might be worth it for folks to look back through their video and images. They might have caught the flash. Maybe we saw it in the virtual star party. <laughs> we probably did. It have wouldn't to look back be the, the first video. time. Yeah, it will be the first the, time. The last Mars opposition was March 2012, so that probably would have been, if it happened in that time, if it, if it didn't happen in your opposition, probably nobody caught it, I would say. Yeah. So seeing a crater like this is, uh, is a pretty big deal because craters are actually really important uh, to planetary science and to astronomy, not just because they look pretty, but they're actually the only way that we can measure the dates, the ages of surfaces that we see in the solar system. Uh, 
basically to measure these ages, you have to go out and pick up a rock and take it to a lab and measure the ratio of, of various elements. And we can't really do that. But we were able to do that for Mars, or for the moon, excuse me, during the Apollo mission. And so we got the age of different places of the moon, and then we basically counted the number of craters in each of those areas. And we assume that craters build up on other planets uh, similar to how they build up on the moon. And so if we see an area with a similar number of craters, we assume it's a similar age to that age we're able to measure on the moon. But of course, you know, on a planet like Mars where you have weather effects, craters are constantly being changed and remodeled. And so being able to look at a crater like almost right from its birth here is going to be a real valuable tool to understanding how the environment interacts with these fresh craters. Now this is your background, isn't it, Maria? You're a planetary geologist, is that right? I'm a planetary scientist, so okay. craters are my particular background, but we use them to date. Uh, right. You know, everything from Enceladus to Mars to Mercury. So we've got a couple of questions then here. Uh, one from Simon Love. Is the blue material from the Mars soil or the impacting object? Uh, the material is almost certainly from the uh, Mars soil. The impacting objects are usually completely vaporized or almost completely vaporized by the impact. Um, but I don't know if this how true color the image is. Um, and then were the smaller craters, this comes from Russell Bateman, were the smaller craters caused by the ejecta? Uh, you'd have to see the before picture to, to know that for sure, and the before pictures were a lot lower resolution. What they do is they go through and they take sort of finding images, and then when they see something interesting, they come back with a high resolution image. Uh, so, probably impossible to say for sure, but it's really uh, common to have all these small craters from basically boulders that are being tossed out. Uh, awesome. And if you look closely enough, one way you could be able to tell is whether those big streaks of material, which are called rays, does, do they go through the crater? those little craters, because if they cover up those little craters, they're probably before this impact. But if they seem to basically be uh, sitting on top of those rays, you know, intersecting them, then it's likely that they were from the same impact. That is really cool. I have a question and a comment. <laughs> I have a comment. Uh, question is from James Haney. Can we discern visually or chemically what the media was made from? Sounds like it would have vaporized and we don't know what it was made from. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so this led to a lot of confusion uh, you know, 50 or 100 years ago when we were starting to understand craters on the Earth because we didn't find anything from the original crater. Uh, you might think out to Meteor Crater uh, out mm -hmm. in the western United States, and there's only, you know, that was a, a crater, a hunk of metal that would have weighed hundreds or thousands of tons, and there's only, you know, a few basically hand-sized pieces of that, that thing that survived. So unlikely that from orbit we'd be able to detect those pieces. And the uh, the crater the using crater counts to determine the ages of surfaces is what we're doing uh, with the CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project. So I wanted to, to add that in, um, in that that's the paper that's coming out soon for Moon Mappers. So the, all the great work you guys have been doing for Citizen Science with Moon Mappers is doing that. Uh, and then for Mercury Mappers as well, I think there's also going to be an aspect of that that's finding the ages of surfaces. Oh, so all those crater critical. markings that you guys are doing out there at CosmoQuest is, is helping to do that science. Awesome. All right, so let's move on. And Nicole, um, yeah. weird asteroid Atokawa. How do we say that? Ito I don't know. I've Itokawa. been saying it Itokawa. Is that correct, David? Itokawa. That, that sounds right to me. That's how I've heard it's Itokawa. Okay, so I've I've also heard it as Itokawa, which is a near Earth asteroid that was um, visited by the Habayusha spacecraft back in 2005. It's this peanut shaped thinger, <laughs> peanut sh peanut shaped guy. It's a uh, Thinger. From the it was <laughs> shut up, and it was uh, and it, it was a pretty um, <clears throat> typical boulder. It was covered in boulders. It's kind of the idea of the rubble pile asteroid uh, that we think of when we say, "Hey, we probably shouldn't send Bruce Willis with a drill and a nuke um, because it's a pile of rubble and it's not going to react the same way that a um, a solid rock will." Well, they've got some more data on it by looking at the light curve of Itokawa over a span of about 12 years using the three and a half meter telescope in Chile. Um, they looked at the light curve data and were able to tell that it, its spin, its rotation was slowing down by 45 microseconds a year. 45, so they did this really precise measurement. From that, they could tell something about the interior composition because the way that it spins depends on how much light is, is sunlight it's absorbing and re-emitting. It's called the Yarkovsky effect, all this stuff. Um, and so they were able to tell that some chunk of it is, has a higher density than the other chunk of it. So one end of the peanut, and I can show you... Uh, I've already this. put a picture up. Oh, you got it. Sweet. Jenny. 
Um, so there's the schematic. So one chunk of it is, is at a much higher density than the other chunk of it. And you can see those are uh, one, the, the 2.8 is probably, you know, a chunk of typical rock. Uh, but the other side is, is quite a bit uh, less dense than, than typical rock. And so it's probably, again, that, that boulder, that pile of stuff. So that tells us a little bit about what, what these asteroids are made of, how they are composed, what we can do if it's hurtling towards Earth, or at least a little bit more about it if we decide we want to visit one of these near-Earth asteroids. So could that be like just like a like an iron meteorite just slowly merging with a stony meteorite, and you just I get this... It'd be it'd be more dense if it was iron. It'd be more like four or five thousand. Right, like the Earth. But it's yeah, some other dense rock, slightly denser rock versus less dense rock. They can't tell exactly what it is, but they can tell that it's got its center of mass is not where it they thought it was. <laughs> so it's denser on one end. JAXA is going to be launching another uh, sample return mission later this year too. Hayabusa two is going off in December. Ooh. Hayabusa two. All right, so Dave Dickinson, uh, you yes. have been following the Progress launch. Yeah, there was a launch of uh, Progress 54 went off on Wednesday off to the International Space Station. It was a fast-track launch. It was a four-orbit, uh, six-hour launch, which are always kind of cool to watch because you can tune into NASA TV and watch the launch, and then about six hours later you can tune in and watch the docking, and they've started doing that with crewed launches here too. It was the first launch of February. It went it went flawlessly. It went pretty well. We we watched both the launch and the docking. It was a night launch. And we actually managed to catch visually the progress that undocked from the Piers module to make way for this one the night before when it passed here over Florida. I've seen most of the spacecraft uh, that that I've seen the Dragon modules, I've seen the ATVs and HTVs, I've seen the shuttles when they were in orbit going up to the ISS. I can't recall ever seeing as many as they've launched. I've never seen the progress of geometry hasn't been right. But it was interesting. It was about a uh, plus one magnitude right in front of the ISS. And that one's still up there right now, too. They're doing some uh, some experimentation on the thrusters before they re-enter the progress M20M, I believe. It's this one that just went off this M22M. And that one is going to re-enter on February 11th. But it's, it's kind of interesting. They've had a really good safety record with the progress. They started back in 78. The only progress they launched, you might remember back in 2011, I believe it was, they, they lost one shortly after launch that uh, crashed out in eastern Siberia. And, and I found out something interesting during that loss, that there's actually a cottage industry in salvaging scrap metal from these rockets and boosters that fall out in eastern Russia, in eastern Siberia. There are people that go after these stage one boosters and, and all this hardware that crashes out there and they salvage it for precious metals. So I think that was kind of weird. Um, I, was, I was trying to get a, this picture here. Okay, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this picture. Now, this isn't the Progress launch, but it's... Oh, there was an Ariane 5 launch yesterday, yeah. yes. Yeah, from, so it was an Ariane uh, 5 launch, Indiana. Yeah, which is cool, and the picture is yeah. the best. So I don't know if this is coming through. Yeah. So this was this was taken from the International Space Station. So so one, one of the astronauts there tweeted that out, and I saw it when Jason Major wrote an article about it last night. Yeah, I'm like that's yeah. pretty cool. I didn't I didn't realize the geometry. They saw the progress launch too, but I didn't see any pictures. Let's see if I can zoom that. in here. It, yeah. So the, so it, Rick Mastracchio, who's on the International Space Station right now, captured this image and check this. So you can see the yeah. the trail. Oh, I know it's yeah. kind of low resolution. They, they they were just lucky that they were going overhead when they launched the Ariane because they're or, they're they're uh, in totally different orbits. Now they've seen it before when they've launched the Progress, but they're usually coming overhead. If you've ever been at the at the Kennedy Space Center on a night launch when the shuttle was going toward the ISS, a lot of times the ISS would pass over ten minutes prior, and that wasn't coincidence. That's because the shuttle was chasing after the ISS, and you see that on Dragon launches too. So usually there's an ISS pass. Then the shuttle or, or the dragon or whatever is going after it will launch after it. So, yeah, so it's just really lucky shot and and so cool. And I love that it's upside down, which I think is just great. In fact, I think uh, <laughs> um, someone, I think Jason might have flipped it over, and then I was like, no, it looks way better upside down. That's right. Yeah, he he flipped it over. So, but I, I love that it's upside down. Yeah, because you could just see the space. The the yes. astronaut, you know, was just took the picture, and then that's the picture. Because well, there's no up in space. There's no so... up in space. Yeah, That's, yeah, that was right, that was so, very lucky they caught that. It was kind of cool. 
Yeah, really cool. All right, so we're going to now have a uh, sort of a battle to the death between Scott, uh, Brian, and, and Elizabeth, and they're going to be they're going to tag team. They're going to join each other and <laughs> Here, talk I'll about. I'll share pictures with some commentary because I can talk about Gaia That's about this end. wobbly alien planet. And yeah. so let's. Okay. So Elizabeth, why don't you why don't you introduce the story and then uh, and then Scott and Brian can can jump in as well. Okay, and the great thing is if I get anything wrong, I have two guys backing me up if something happens. But anyway, essentially what's been going on is the Kepler Space Telescope, which might or might not be searching for planets in the future. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, it was searching for planets, and it found this really bizarre planet, which is called Kepler 413b. And essentially what it's doing is it's orbiting around two dwarf stars, and its axis is wobbling as it's doing that every 11 years, and compared to Earth, on Earth we also have an axis wobble, but it takes place over about, what is it, 30,000, I think? Anyway, yeah, quite like a bit 26, long. 26,000 years. 26,000. Mm-hmm. 26,000 years, yeah. Uh-oh. No. No. Uh, no. I really <laughs> Nicole is wobbling for us. <laughs> Elizabeth is breaking up. Her, it sounds like her latency is wobbling. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go back to we'll go with Brian when when her internet catches up. Brian. Okay. Uh, so I couldn't quite catch exactly how far she had gotten, but the the orbit of this planet is tilted about five degrees relative to the plane of the stars. So the two stars are orbiting in a plane, and then the planet is tilted about five degrees. And because of this, the orbit changes over time. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is they were kind of lucky to catch this with Kepler. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things... Oh, come on! Uh, like, Is this like a story that can't be told? <laughs> Actually, I'm hacking the internet right now. This is my story, and I will talk about it. <laughs> That's it, all right. Cool. <laughs> keep, keep going, Brian. Keep trying. Okay. So, so because of this wobble... Um, Kepler finds planets by what's known as the transit method. And so the planet has to pass in front of the star from our point of view. What Kepler actually saw was they saw three transits and then a gap of 800 days and then five more transits. The transits are spaced 66 days apart. So it caught it and then it moved out of alignment because of its wobble of orbit and then they caught it again. And so that's why they could find it. When they do the orbit analysis, it's not supposed to come back into alignment for until 2020. So if they would have looked at a different time, they wouldn't have seen it at all. And that's what I love about it, is that we just happen to see three of them in a row, and then it just disappears. Like, uh, you were doing something, and then you stopped it, and it just came back later. Being able to see that, I found was just really fascinating. Uh, Trying to figure out why it's doing that as well. You know, there's there are a couple of hypotheses. Either there's a third, very faint star, or possibly another planet there that's really affecting the way that it's orbit. Yeah, we're not so sure why it would be tilted like that. So it's not a precessional wobble like we were talking about the precession of the equinoxes with the Earth. It's it's an orbital. No, because because the yeah. two stars interact because they're orbiting. They're not. It's not like a a blade sphere where okay. you're going to get this wobble. It's actually the two orbits, and so if you happen to be close to one, you're getting pulled down. If you happen to be close to another one, you get pulled in another direction. So it's really this much more complex orbital dynamics than you would see just from the Earth or something. So would this give us, like, weird seasons? Is this, like, Game of Thrones? Like, what's going on? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it would give us crazy seasons, you know, when you're you're talking, you already have your axial tilt, which is what, you know, right. causes for the season anyway, but then when you're having it being affected even more just by your orbit going off as well, you're going to be having such a difference in axial tilt as your, you know, as the procession's going on. So every 11 years it's going like this. It, you're not going to have seasons like we have here that are going to be changing rapidly. It has a period of 66 days, so you have that. But it's going to be fluctuating every 11 years what spring is going to be and what summer is going to be. So it's going to be completely different all the time. It's, it's very long- Game of Thrones. Yeah, so long- it. And you don't know when. You could have a short winter, you could have a long winter. Who knows? That, so that's it. So it's been explained. It's, we we've explained. It. Yeah, but it, it was <laughs> a 66-day year. Winter's coming, and it's gone. And <laughs> yeah. 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 M- Milankovitch would be rolling over in his grave. Well, what if there was a longer version of this and maybe a more extreme wobble on the... Uh, 
on that going above or and below. Or maybe George R. R. Martin just doesn't care about astronomy. <laughs> No, we have to find it. He knows. And well, we come on, there, there's red it. comets. Red right? comets, yeah. yeah. So he yeah. cares somewhat about stuff. And, and there's thing. magic. And magic. And, and dragons. Magic. And yeah, dragon. Dragon. South Park, there's other things. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, unless there's anything else you guys want to add. I, I love it. I I think this is what I just love all the stuff we're still getting from Kepler, even though now Kepler's really not, you know, because of the the wheels and everything like that. But we're still finding some really awesome things. I'm really glad that we did focus and have this mission because we're still able to get so much more data out of it. And actually, there's a lot that we're able to do now by able to go through with even old data, even 15 years ago, getting more and more, since we have more ways of processing this data, yeah. we're able to find out so much more about it. So I, I'm loving yeah. the new things we're discovering with the Kepler data. We need a Kepler 2 with well, 10 gyros. TP, uh, Tess. Yeah. Tess, 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 that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Tess is Kepler, but shallower survey and all sky. Yeah, yeah, it'll be all sky, so. Better, better chance of follow-up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a quick question from number... Oh, gosh, this person's name is number 100 billion and one. Uh, yes, that is Earth years. Whenever we say years, we do mean Earth years. Uh, how long does it take to orbit the sun? And I think that you guys said that was 66 days. Yeah, it's a 66 days. Okay, just Two wanted to clear months. that up for commenter number 100, and 100 billion and one. So to, to give a perspective, Mercury's period is 88 days. So it's a little bit smaller than Mercury's. Mm-hmm. Also not habitable. Yeah, no, not yeah, by me. The world. So, you know, don't, again, don't think you're going to live there and rule Westeros. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's move on. So now, Elizabeth, how's your internet doing? You think it's good? Is it stable? You I ready? Think it's good. Yeah, it seems to be better. It was choppy before, but I rebooted it. So. Okay, so, so, so super Earths are super habitable? Yeah, I was having trouble wrapping my head around this as well because, all right, let's back up a second. So you got the Earth, and then you've got planets that are a little bit bigger but still rocky, and we call them super-Earths, and they generally range in size from the size of Earth to the size of Neptune. Now, there's new research out there that's showing that if the planet is just slightly bigger than Earth, let's say about two to three times, it might actually be better for life to arise on there than it would be on Earth. Now, and when you're saying bigger, though, rocks. you're talking more massive, right? So two to They're three more times massive, more right. massive, right? Cause more massive. You, yeah. yeah. So two to three times more masses than the Earth, which would mean that you would have a better ability to hold on to a thick atmosphere, for example, which would make it a little bit easier for organisms to arise on there. The tectonic activity wouldn't happen as often as a smaller planet, which means that life would be a lot more stable. Things would be a lot more stable for life to live in over there. So this is just really cool because I never had imagined that something that would be just slightly bigger than Earth might be better. And so the corollary to this is if these super-Earths are more habitable or more... Um, favorable for habitability, then Earth itself might be quite rare. And so now the scientists that were doing the study are saying that if we're going to be looking for life outside of Earth, we shouldn't actually be looking at planets like our own. We should be looking at ones that are just slightly more massive. Which are be, easier to find. Which are easier to find, which is fantastic yeah. because it's hard to spot another Earth out there. I mean, I think one of the things that's quite interesting is that people think that that if you have something that's twice or three times the mass of Earth, it's going to have twice or three times the gravity, but it but it doesn't, right? You know, it can be a little bit bigger or and have you know double or triple the mass, but you're only going to get the gravity. It's like 1.2, maybe up to 1.5. So it's not as mm -hmm. it's not as killer as you would think. No, exactly. And I mean, if we wanted to land there in a spacecraft, it'd be pretty much the same thing as it would be on Earth. I mean, when you think about it. We're talking about doing Mars missions where the gravity is only 40% that of Earth, and so the range is certainly quite doable. Yeah. Uh, philosophical point. What doesn't, I mean, the, the evolution of life on Earth has a lot of uh, catastrophes and things that force evolution along or major, um, major extinction events. Do you think without those that life would stay pretty simple? Have they, did they, well, they address that at all? No. Yeah, that, that wasn't really covered in this paper in particular, but there is a lot of research out there saying that, for example, if the planets had not moved back and forth during their evolution, which some theories say that they did, that we wouldn't have had as many asteroids and comets making their way into the inner solar system with water on them and hitting the Earth and then possibly making water arise on our own planet. And that's one thing that could be affected that may not be possible in another solar system. 
So that just shows you how little we know about how life arose on here in the first place. That's really cool. Um, well, that's it then. No, now, Brian, did you have anything to add on that? Did you looked into the story or? Uh, no, I was actually trying to do in my head what the calculation was with the surface gravity. <laughs> I did, yeah, okay. and how did that work out? It's Friday. There's no way I'm doing Nerd. that. Either. Okay, I did. I did. I'll, I'll, I'm just trying to calculate, calculate I'll, I'll in my calculate. head the gravity. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll calculate it out. I'll actually Ties write a post. Tight, 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 not the circulation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did the math, or I I sort of looked up some math, and there was like I did a, a video on super Earths, and. Uh, and it was, like I said, it was about, I think there was like a super Earth, it was twice the mass of Earth, mm -hmm. and it, but the density was a little lower, and the end up with the gravity was like 1.1 or 1.2 times the gravity of Earth. So, anyway, but the point being that it's not, you, it's, you're not going to get two, three, five, ten times the gravity of Earth. You're going to get something that's a little more reasonable as the thing gets more massive and, and it'll, it'll be a little more challenging for them to become spacefaring, but not impossible. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right, is that yeah. it's so they hard for, for us to get off it's this planet. It's hard enough here. It would, yeah. Yeah, that's the part that would really suck, is if you're in 1.2, 1.3 times the gravity. But maybe have they have trilithium, and they don't want to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. There's a comment from Leonard Lindstrom. So where are all the extraterrestrials? Trapped at the bottom of deep gravity wells. <laughs> 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 yeah, Could just be. go into orbit and just laugh at them. <laughs> What's the matter? How's your space program doing? Yeah. Oh, you would do no. that. Their space program is jumping. You're like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Amy, your title. I summon you to the podium to All talk right. about colliding galaxies. I accept this being summoned thing. Um, okay, so a um, bit of an interesting thing in, in galaxies this week, or maybe it came out last week, actually, the research. The paper was published in Astrof the Astrophysical Journal. Um, so... Basically, what we know about galaxies is that they are they are born from the stuff that came out of meh at the Big Bang, and um, as they get older and stars form and you know the change of material and stuff, they get more massive and they they have less star formation the older they get. But the weird thing is that astronomers have found galaxies that are as young as three billion years old, which you know, it doesn't sound so young, but it is quite young. Um, that are as as young as three billion years old that have are quite massive and have almost no star formation. So this has kind of been been the thing that doesn't actually make any sense, and astronomers haven't quite been able to figure out what's been going on um, to explain this kind of uh, inactivity. Um, so a researcher uh, from the dark a professor of dark cosmology center at the University of Copenhagen, uh, so I think SUNY or I might be pronouncing that wrong, SUNY Toft. Um, decided to look a little bit further back in time to figure out what was making these early galaxies big, massive, and kind of dead so early in their lives. Um, and he looked at um, galactic collisions, the idea that galaxies are colliding um, and exchanging material or merging in some cases. Now this isn't a new idea. We, the Milky Way, we being the Milky Way, um, are on a collision course with, course rather with the Andromeda galaxy. I think we're like four billion years out from that one, if anyone can verify that that date. So we've got some time to prepare ourselves, but galaxies collide, and when they do, their you know, stuff mixes, and sometimes they spread out, or they take on weird shapes, and that's one of the ways that astronomers think we have things like spiral-armed galaxies and elliptical galaxies. And uh, Toft and his team have suggested that maybe very gas-rich galaxies colliding and merging when they're very young create this super-rich nucleus of st like rapid star activity that just doesn't sustain itself very long so what you end up with is a galaxy that's quite young that's just three billion years old that looks like a much older galaxy it's like not quite a Benjamin Button but it looks like a Benjamin Button galaxy. It's, it's like live fast uh, die young <laughs> it's live fast yeah, die young it's the live galaxies I, I think yes. it was pretty funny there as wow, Amy was nice. saying four billion years <laughs> the entire panel was nodding I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah, that I was like a right. bunch of bobbleheads. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah. I actually got a question for Brian. Actually, someone asked me this: was Are there any galaxies forming now, or are all of the galaxies that will be have they already formed? Any idea? Um, well, I, it, I would say it, you're probably going to have galactic mergers. 
more but than no more new galaxies, galaxies no, forming. No new galaxies forming on their own, probably not. Yeah, yeah. All that happened really early on. Um, yeah. Little baby galaxies formed very early on, and since that time, they've been merging. Um, right. So Amy's and, and our modern galaxy is basically clumps and voids now. Clumps and voids. Oh, yeah, we have galaxy clusters. <laughs> and we have voids between them. Ah, okay. Yeah, like the biggest thing in the universe is nothing, right? Right. Big, and then we have these void. tendrils uh, of galaxies that are clustered together that have this big filamental right. structure. Right. Amy yeah, had a hand awesome. up. I have a question for Amy the astronomer. Amy had a hand up. Um, when do you, is there, does somebody know when the most recent galaxy formation was? Like, is there, do we have an idea of, like, at what point in the age of the universe galaxies just stopped forming? I just thought of it. I just wondered that. <laughs> it's but way before we can yeah. see with optical infrared telescopes at the okay. moment. It's back in the epoch yeah. of reionization era, okay. which we so have large is... radio rays looking for that signal now. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is not something that we have any clear idea of, like. Yeah. Right. You know, we can we can look really far back, far back, and we already see sophisticated galaxies. Yeah. So sometime before yesterday, that's when yeah. that happened. Basically. <laughs> Thank you, Stoic Scott. <laughs> I aim to narrow things down. Yeah. So in the present and 13th century. Not tomorrow is the answer. <laughs> yes. Well, in astronomy, we have big you know, <laughs> margins of errors, and so it wasn't yesterday. It was sometime before that. But sure. I think you know, once we get the James Webb Space Telescope up there, it's going to be seeing right to the edge of the observable universe pretty much. Okay. It's going to see these, these galaxies. Don't on, they don't hate on Webb. I'm not hating on Webb. I'm just saying the... Epic of reionization experiments are going to give us a lot of information before Webb gets there. I agree. And really? I, is, this, also, is it a race? Is this is race. it on? It's it is race. absolutely it's a race. On. And right. I'm really excited to see what's coming it's out with frontier fields too before Webb gets out there, just by using those galaxy clusters to look further back. But that's Webb it. is going to be amazing. The, so like Hubble's going to be like, you know, catch up, guys. Sorry, you know. Oh, yeah, we already, yeah. We already so solved it. We built this huge web telescope, and then, like, oh, we'll just use galaxy clusters, gravitational lensing, go home web. We got yeah. this. We, don't <laughs> worry. We're going to use dark matter as our telescope. The universe is our telescope. Yeah. Of course, James Webb can do that, too. So you yeah. know. Especially once Hubble has found them all, James Webb could look at the same ones and He's like, oh, that's take cute. It to, Here, yeah. I'll, I'll use a better wavelength. Yeah, or just see the right to the edge everywhere I look. Yeah. Um, all yeah. right, well, let's move on. Um... I choose. Rails off. Is this like <laughs> space Pokemon? You're like, which which nerd should I use? Which nerd should I use? Up to your surface gravity you planet. Have us collected all at the bottom. Here. Go go, Scott Lewis, go. No, uh, no. I could um, I could go. No no. Hey, well, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to you, but first, Dave Dickinson, <laughs> I can see, down. is struggling with his internet. So, uh, oh, it's, it, it, it it seems like I'm back now. Before we, but we've lost your identity. <laughs> Uh, oh, I put down the lower. Yeah, I just yeah. kind of put in a quick lower third. Uh, so what? Uh, so what's what's happening with Venus? By the way, I saw Venus this morning. It's amazing. Yeah, I was Venus, up at like six a.m. and there's a super bright star. There's Venus. Boom. Venus is reaching it its, take its much brightest. Yeah. To see Venus, Venus it's a planet. Its, <laughs> yeah. It's reaching its brightest for 2014. Coming up here February 11th, it's going to be magnitude negative 4.7 which is bright enough to cast a shadow if you're somewhere where you, you've got a good high contrast background like uh, snowfall on the ground or something like that. And you can actually do a time exposure of your shadow from Venus. I've seen that done before where people just aim a camera opposite to Venus on the ground and stand there and take like a 10-minute time exposure and you can see where it's casting a shadow. If you can't see it with the naked eye, you can see it with the camera. The internet, but I challenge being, you. Yeah. Take mm -hmm. that picture right now. Do that? Yeah. I've, I've, Send I've, it seen, I've seen it actually done with... I see we will it run Jupiter it in opposition too. I will assign David Dickinson a story <laughs> covering your photograph if you take it. All right. That's cool. That would be. I'll tweet clear. about it because I ain't taking it. I'm no, in L.A. That I'll ain't a, happening. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you go and you take a picture and you send it to David Dickinson, we will run a story on Universe Today because that's awesome. Be Venus is spending all of 2014, pretty much all of 2014, in the morning sky. It doesn't reach opposition until I believe it's in late November, or not opposition, but it reaches uh, 
superior conjunction on the other side of the sun. But it just feels Venus. like we were viewing it passing right by the sun just a couple of weeks inferior ago. Inferior conjunction, yeah, that, that's when it, moves, when it makes its, uh, its moving fastest in relation to the Earth, where you're, uh, you're, its apparent motion against the background sky is the fastest, is the best way to say it. That was in last month, about yeah. this time, and now it's already moving up into the morning sky, so it's really trucking right now. And it's when you look at it through a telescope, it's a very thin crescent, and it's starting to get wider. And it's going to reach greatest elongation for the morning sky on, I've written down here, March 22nd. It's going to be 46.6 degrees west of the sun. And then it's going to continue on. It's actually going to get occulted by the moon on February 26th. However, we won't see it here in North America. The best place to see it will be in the, in the morning in Western Africa. You'll actually see the crescent moon occult, the crescent Venus, which would be kind of cool, but you've got to be right in the right position to see it. So uh, I wonder if Corey, uh, won't Corey see that Schmitz is in South Africa. I wonder if he'll he, be able to take a crack at it. Uh, South Africa to, will miss it. You, you've got to be in Western Africa, like like Northwestern Africa. Like so while they're here. doing that, the Crescent Moon, Crescent Venus, they should be eating croissants just to <laughs> get be, it yeah. all. But that would be you really know, cool to see that, that sort of the, the same there, crescent, almost in the same position, right? And then just... Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, there, there's a controversy about something called the ashen light of Venus. You know how the Earth has, uh, the moon has Earth shine where you see the dark side of the moon lit up? Now, we know that's because the Earth, the sunlight's being reflected off the Earth back onto the nighttime side of the moon. Venus has a very spurious illusion that observers have claimed. However, Venus has no reflecting body next to it. So there's a lot of discussion on what's called the ashen light of Venus and what causes that. And there's been some discussion about if you could photographically catch it, say, when the dark limb of the moon was occulting that bright crescent of Venus, you might actually see this uh, this, this spurious uh, sky glow kind of effect on, on the nighttime side of Venus. There, there's a lot of theories about it might be... Uh, the leading theories is probably an optical illusion because you're looking at a very dark limb of Venus through the telescope next to a very bright crescent. But there's also, if there's anything to it, it might be uh, lightning underneath the Venetian cloud tops. It might be aurora, which Venus doesn't have much of a magnetic field, so it's probably not aurora. There was even an idea back in the 19th century before we knew anything about Venus that we were seeing maybe the glow of cities underneath the cloud cover on Venus, hmm. which, of course, we know now is not true. But uh, there's there's been a lot of discussion of what ash and light of Venus is, so it's just it's kind of an interesting thing at the telescope to watch out for. Wonder if you would see that from Venus Express. They must be looking for this kind of thing with Venus Express. You think, yeah, there's they they look for it. it's it's never been really imaged with the spacecraft or anything. It's like I said the 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 consensus is, is probably an optical illusion. Again, when you're looking at uh, the nighttime side of Venus next to that really dazzling crescent through the telescope, it's hard to not have your mind kind of want to fill in that region next to it with something. You know, when you're looking at the crescent and just filling in the circle, so. It's very spurious. Reflection from the Venusian alien space station? Is that well, enough? The, the big Amazonian yeah, jungles just... that are obviously on Venus. Right, right. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, send letters to Dave Dickinson. Uh, <laughs> How wrong is your science at daviddickinson.com? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so now we've got a couple of... Uh, I guess, public service announcements um, to make. One from Elizabeth Howell about uh, Astronomy 365. Yes, I'm a proud member of 365 Days of Astronomy, which is an awesome set of podcasts that happens every single day of the year that is focused on astronomy. And they have just started out their 2014 season. It's their sixth year of operations, and they would love for you to contribute. So if you go to my Universe Today story on the website, um, I have some details in there about... Uh, they can contribute podcasts, or also if you want to contribute some money, they'd be willing to have that as well. And uh, they're an initiative of CosmoQuest, and probably Nicole has a couple things to say about it as well. Yes, go, Nicole, money go. is good. Money is good, so we can pay people to make them pretty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then you can also, um, in addition to the user-submitted podcast, you will hear the Weekly Space Hangout uh, and Learning Space uh, also included as audio files. So those come out every week as well. I think but, a yeah. cast audio gets put out through that as well. I, yes, Astronomy Cast yes, is on yes. there, uh, and there's a couple of other. Uh, Morgan does a monthly news roundup for us. Um, there's a couple of other monthly shows that happen at the beginning of the end of the month, and then we get some from Nancy Atkinson occasionally, uh, doing with Survey, I think. Uh, so that's like the lunar and planetary science stuff. Um, and I think 
it's important to get this point across to anyone who is in the space blogging, space writing sphere, is that we want to be your friend, and we want to promote whatever it is that you're doing, and we have created all of these venues to help promote and get the word out on what it is that you're all doing. The 365 days, even this, right? What we're doing right now is a way that we can showcase the work that you as space journalists are doing to kind of get the word out and, and improve the, the knowledge of, of space and astronomy. And so don't feel like there's some kind of in crowd and then some kind of out crowd. Yeah, we, are we are a as bunch of dorks. We are a bunch of dudes, and we are literally... We as have no egos, you know? We, yeah, we are literally trying to be as inclusive as humanly possible. We, we, What else could we do? So send yeah. us tweets, drop us an email. If you want to participate in the things we're doing, 365, if you want to show up on this show, on the Virtual Star Party, and all of the other things that we have, we really want you guys to all be able to participate and contribute, and if we can help you, know, you get the word out on the stories you're working on, we're glad to help, so... So don't feel ever like we're send not Send us your audio, yeah. send us your stories, yeah. and send us donations to keep paying our producers. Yeah. Because and literally, I think <laughs> all of the yeah, all the people who are on this show right now, like maybe like at one point mentioned maybe they want to do some writing, and we're like, come on, let's get, let's get you involved. So so that I hope you feel everyone feels that is the community that we've built here, and so uh, the more the better. We will trap you. We will trap yeah. you, and we are the we look like all woman of this fuzzy lobby, but they yeah. space Borg. Yeah, space Borg. You will be assimilated. Yeah, it really is. So just don't fight it. Just yeah. just join it's, us. Right? Resistance is futile. Just yeah. just join us. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah. Brian, you know, you see, you're feeling this. Come on. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, the other thing, oh, one other thing is we're going to be recording two episodes of Astronomy Cast pretty much in the next couple of hours. So I think the schedule is there. Uh, okay. We're catching up because Pamela was so sick, and uh, and then she we're going to get one show ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sick and write and still writing grants. Yeah, so oh. yeah. so we're going to catch up and and get a little ahead. So that's happening as well. Um, Dave Dickinson, you've got some yes. information about some space history. Oh, the the one about the uh, space relics that the I wrote? Space artifacts. Yeah, that, that, that was kind of a fun one to write. There was a few things on there that were were kind of... That, that was something I had been shopping around, and, and as I was writing the article, it became more of a Universe Today type article, so I pitched it off to where Nancy, and she's like, sure, put it on the site. It's uh, I was just looking at curious things that had been fired off into space, like the the Pioneer plaques and the Voyager records. And then as I combed into it more, I had known they had put things on New Horizons, like their state quarters on New Horizons. There's a postage stamp. There's a Clyde Tombaugh's ashes are on board there. I think it was curious they didn't put any kind of alien uh, postcard on New Horizons because it's escaping the solar system too. So. So those state quarters are going to totally confuse any alien salvagers when they find them on the on New Horizons because it's leaving to orbit the galaxy for millions of years as well. There were a few on there I had never actually heard of. Uh, supposedly there was what was called the um, Moon Museum that was affixed. They think it was affixed to the lander on Apollo 12 that's up there on the moon that was a small little postage stamp size uh, uh, artwork that was constructed by Andy Warhol and some other uh, artists back in the 1960s. There's there's rumors it was affixed to the the descent stage of Apollo 12. Nobody will know until they go up there and uh, and look at it again and see if that's actually there. So, and there was also uh, another one I had never come across before. There was a there was a large armored uh, plate that was ejected from a nuclear explosion back in 1957 that they think might have achieved escape velocity. It's, it was kind of interesting. It was an atomic test called Pascal B during Operation Plum Bob. It was actually a few months before Sputnik. And when they played back the high-speed video, it was an underground nuclear explosion. When they played back the high-speed video, this, this cap that, fl that flew off can be seen in like two frames. And they calculated that it actually was about, that it was moving at about seven times escape velocity. So it may well be in orbit, but we'll never know unless it comes back around at us again or anything. So, yeah, it can, space can keep that. Not for gravity, But it's strange to think that may have actually been the first object launched into space prior to Sputnik. Maybe. If it didn't burn up on uh, passing through the atmosphere. When it, What's such when a it monument his name is Operation Plumbob? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Amy, you must have a collection of these kinds of weird Do you have a collection of Plumbobs? Plumbobs, Amy? Plum Amy? Bobs, Amy? Of, 
of what what was what now? Plum bobs? SpongeBob? Ignore no. them. <laughs> um, <laughs> of relics, have, of interesting the... relics that have been sent to space, like Andy Warhol paintings. Me, me personally, no. I, I don't own any fantastic space relics. Did these things cost um, money? <laughs> they yeah, don't pay um, writers much. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. No, I should know more stories. There none none are coming to my mind right now. I'm trying to think if I've ever read anything definitive about the Apollo 12 one, but I haven't. So so we're going to have to go back. That one I had never heard about. There is astronaut poop on the moon though. I know Plenty. that. Yeah. Really? Everywhere. Yeah, they oh, That's a good one. Because yeah, it's left, it's weight um, that they could Yeah, no, they I know. I know it back. makes sense. Like, yeah. like like little bags. I I know uh, another Another one I came across is uh, Gene Shoemaker. His ashes went to the moon on uh, Lunar Prospector. Uh, he he had he was a geologist that trained to be an astronaut, but he never got to go to the moon. And they had sent his ashes up there too. So that that was another interesting one. Compilation wow. prize. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Ouch. That was oh. terrible. Uh, and so I love you for it. Uh, so Scott, you put up uh, here something about Gaia, and I have no yes. idea what you wanted to talk about. Gaia? No, it's I put it in the spreadsheet because. Hey, I, God I put it on the how. wrong tab in this spreadsheet. So, um, so Guy, let me s- screen share real quick. So, uh, back in December, Gaia launched, and Gaia is amazing. It is a one billion star surveyor, and it is going to be up there for a five year mission. It's just getting started, and it took a test image in the large Magellanic Cloud. So, here is a star cluster that Gaia took. Ooh, pretty. It is very pretty. Unfortunately, for people excited about it like me, this is going to be one of the last images we see from Gaia for a very long time. Um, because they're, they're just trying to get stuff tested. They It's going to take several months for everything to be uh, set up, all the mirrors and the 1 billion uh, pixel uh, detector on that, getting everything up and running. But I, I'm just so super excited about this. So they're getting some some images going on with it. They're getting everything going. Everything seems to be fine. It's at Lagrangian two point. And I honestly, this is like one of the most exciting things in 2014 that I'm looking forward to is this survey starting with Gaia, getting to see the the most comprehensive 3D map of stars of our galaxy immediately surrounding us. It's going to be about 1% of the stars of our galaxy, and it's all immediately surrounding us. And just gives us a better perspective and context of where we are in our in our neighborhood. So we won't see pretty pictures, but we will know with incredible precision the location and speed and motion of yeah, all the, of these the stars. Yeah, the color will be... I mean, I, I, I want to screen share, too, because the video that Lisa put out is awesome. Um, so... Do that. Guy, will, Guy will probably find lots more exoplanets and mm-hmm. uh, near Earth asteroids and comets, and there's going to be a lot of uh, spin off discoveries from Gaia, too, yeah. they, they anticipate. So, are there any more questions, Nicole? Do we have any questions? No, but we have one more story. You have one more story from you? Yes. All right. <laughs> Just a quick update on the M82 Supernova, uh, Supernova 2014J, which I still have not seen because I'm a wuss and it's cold. Uh, but the VLA, the Very Large Array, the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico went looking for the radio afterglow. Uh, there usually isn't a radio afterglow in a white dwarf supernova. However, they went looking anyway because it's so close. Why not? Uh, they didn't see it, but they did make a gorgeous, gorgeous new image of the uh, central regions of M82. And so they were able to see all of this filamentary structure that they've never seen before since the, since the VLA has been upgraded since the last time they did an imaging project like this. So uh, a couple people on Twitter said it looked like a fuzzy paramecium, and I think that's adorable. <laughs> so pretty, pretty picture of M82, no supernova, but uh, gorgeous new image with new structure. It's surprising that they haven't taken a picture of that object with that detail. I haven't seen... Well, the VLA's been upgraded. It's got right. ten times the sensitivity now. At least ten times the sensitivity now. Uh, so that you can see ten sensitive. times the fur on the galaxy. <laughs> the fuzziness. <laughs> Aww. Uh, uh, is that flocculent? No, I guess it's not flocculent. It's a little flocculent. It's yeah. Flocculent. All right. Uh, so let's did not see, see, see any look. other questions though. Uh, oh, does no. assimilation hurt? Does. <laughs> no, no, it's it's and even if it did, me. that's erased from your memory. Yeah, so it's all right. <laughs> Uh, right, so then let's, uh, and here's the here's the payoff for all these people who come and show up. Amy, share a title. Where do we find out more? How can we appreciate all of the hard work that you're doing? 
Um, I am on Twitter as AST Vintage Space, and you can find me by name on Facebook and Google Plus. And my blog, Vintage Space, is at Popular Science. Um, I'm elsewhere, but have been working on some other stuff lately, so I've been a little bit quieter on the online front. But Twitter's a pretty good place to look for me. The less we hear from you, the more we're going to see in the future. And the more I'm doing, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know the feeling. All right, Brian Coberline, where do we find out more? Uh, search for my name. I'm BrianCarverline.com, also on Google+. I post every day, uh, also on Universe Today, so occasionally I do a post. So you can and, find show me there. And, and show up for class. Do your homework. And show and show up for class, yeah. You should assign uh, to, the, you know, to your students the Blue Space Hangout. I know <laughs> that, that does that. Yeah, so, yeah. and the VSP. Yeah. Uh, Dave Dickinson, where do we find out more? See, I was active this week on my site, Astro Guys with the Z. I'm Astro Guys with the Z on Twitter. I was active on Listasaur, Universe Today, and I'm writing up a big post on the upcoming Mars opposition for 2014. And I'm monitoring, supposedly there was a bright comet, maybe bright comet, found in the stereo data this morning. We're trying to see right now if this is anything worth amateurs trying to spot or if it's just a run-of-the-mill sun grazer. So if, if it is anything interesting, I'll be writing about that shortly as well. Someone's getting a comet named after them. <laughs> Not me. Not you. Okay. Elizabeth Howell, where do we find out more? Um, Universe Today, of course. I'm the new senior writer there. In addition to that, if you go to my Twitter feed, Howell Space, H-O-W-E-L-L -L Space, you can see all the other places I write for, which include space.com, um, some 365 Days of Astronomy, some Space Exploration Network, and other fun, spacey places. Sweet. Morgan Renberg. Yeah, you can hear me on the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast. Uh, the website's cosmicchatter.org, and I'm cosmic underscore chatter on Twitter. Nice. Dr. Gallucci? Hi, I live over at CosmoQuest, CosmoQuest.org. Why is he laughing at me? <laughs> okay. Actually, we should be Dr. Dr. Coberline, too, right? Dr. Doctor. Yeah, he's a doctor. Yeah. Right. Doctor, a doctor, 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 yeah. doctor. But mine's recent, so I'm still in the glow of it. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so I'm I've seen over... things, man, you don't know. <laughs> I'm over at CosmoQuest, and this week we are featuring uh, our, our upcoming class at Cosmo Academy, uh, by being taught by Peter Dove. He is teaching Introduction to Astronomy via Color Imaging. That starts up in just about two weeks. So if you have, you don't have to have any experience with astronomy or photography coming in, he will teach you how to do image processing using uh, data from research telescopes. I'll put the link on the, on the uh, Hangout event pages. So check that out at Cosmo Academy. That uh, we would really love to see if some people want to do color imaging. Uh, and I'll also shamelessly plug that I'm teaching a Cosmo Academy class on life in the universe because I love astrobiology. So oh, it'll so be a little cool. snippet of the uh, course, I, the undergrad course I taught at the University of Virginia. So wh where do people find out about that? Cosmoacademy.org. We'll take you right there. Yeah, there's a bunch of courses that are that are there now. So yes, that is really cool. If you want to learn more, have Nicole teach you. Yay! <laughs> Scott Lewis, where do we find out more? Everywhere. Um, let's see. I at Virtual Star Party, of course. So every Sunday night with some guy from Canada, we we hey. share the <laughs> we share the stars with everyone. Um, also, uh, Deep Astronomy and Space Fan News. So we just uploaded a new video of Space Fan News on our brand new channel, and we have a hangout in five hours called Space Fan News Live, where we discuss the latest episode. Uh, we're doing it to celebrate our one millionth follower on our Google Plus, and it's been kind of crazy, so we created a new channel for it, so we're all excited about that. Uh, I am Bald Astronomer on Twitter for some reason, and I also run knowthecosmos.com. Awesome. All right, and once again, I am Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and you can just search for Universe Today. F. Kane on Twitter. Which is fun. F. Kane. Um, you use Twitter? I do. I do. I tried. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I can't. I can't promise. Yeah, I'll true. try, but I'll try to try. Um, so and so, thanks everyone for watching. Really appreciate it. And thanks to the team of panelists. Uh, again, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, to sort of get everyone up to speed on the big space news. And we will see you all next week. Except you won't see me next week. I'm gonna be away next week, so you'll see Nicole. I think is gonna be the host, right? Yeah, I think so. All right, cool. I would be in control. <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you all next week. I'll see you guys later, five hours. Later.
Bye, Bye everyone. And astronomy casting in like an hour. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>